do anything you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. hello. Um, we, we didn't sign up for these bright lights. I'm sorry if that's um, horribly glaring for you guys, but we can still see you. It's, it's really, really cool. Look... You look like sort of like you're in an aquarium. It's sort <laughs> yeah. of light green. It's amazing in there. Yeah. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Particularly that bit in the middle where the sunshine's coming down. <laughs> Yeah, that's almost like there's some kind of divine intervention going on in your glass of water. That's am- I'm going to photograph that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, clearly you can see that I'm not the most... Uh... There you go. Incredible. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. I'll shut that up that, that was a good start. So um, welcome, everybody, to the beautiful Colchester Art Centre that we all love. And if you haven't been here before, wow enjoy um we are here as appetite book club which is part of the redline books book club in collaboration with the essex book festival i hope you're keeping up um so it's a little bit different to a normal author event because lots of you if you've booked your tickets will know that the book was included so i'm hoping you have your own questions and it's going to be very much an audience participation um and often with author events you can't do spoilers and it's really tricky but I know that authors love this format because we can really find out what you think so I am going to hand you over to the amazing Helen McDonald oh. <laughs> <laughs> um I'm really sorry that the co-author Sin the extraordinary and wonderful Sin Blaché um cannot be here because she has got Covid and is currently really angry and grumpy about it. <laughs> and I spoke to them last night and they were like, have a lovely time. But um, yeah, they're, they're really sorry they can't be here. Which is interesting because um, a few people have said, this book is so seamless. Did they really write it Yeah, together? there's a conspiracy theory now that there isn't a sin. <laughs> 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 but there is which there is and jamie from redline books will be interviewing so we will have um these guys talking please do think of any questions along the way and then w- once they finished we will open it up with a roving mic so Ooh, um i love that let's like do a little round of applause to welcome our people in over to you <laughs> and i'll hand over to jamie okay, thanks joe so it is difficult to know where to start with this book <laughs> start um, anywhere you like i know it's so it's a, a an epic sci-fi novel, but it's also a, a spy thriller. It's also a romance. It's a big queer a romance. Spoiler? Yeah, it's a romance. Book. No, that's not a spoiler. It's yeah. really a romance. Um, how do you uh, how do you describe the book? When a romp. Explaining it to other people. A romp. Yeah. yeah. No, we just use all the words, and then it really freaks out booksellers. They're like, "Where do we put it?" And we go, "The front table." <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a thriller, sci-fi, military, espionage. I think that's all spy, isn't it? Uh, psychedelic existential philosophical i mean yeah you can just we just we'd had a lot of fun but that was how the book came about really we just wanted to put all the things we loved in one in one place mm. so that's what we did and it's very the, self-indulgent <laughs> the the two of you writing together yeah. how did that come about um you mentioned last night that um most of the book was written through direct messages on twitter it was written is, on twitter okay which is <laughs> kind of both amazing and a little bit sad i think mm. so yeah, I'd known Sin only as a person on Twitter for about 10 years. We'd spoke very, very infrequently. She was a friend of a friend. And we mainly talked about Doctor Who. You know, that's the kind of level of discussion that we had. I didn't like that episode. <laughs> um, and then during lockdown, both of us were stuck in our respective um, houses. And, you know, the outside was really, really grim. So we just started talking about all the stuff we loved on TV and films. And um, Sin is a massive video gamer. Um, something I completely inco- find completely incomprehensible because I'm old. Um, and uh, I discovered that Sin was an extraordinary writer, um, particularly in terms of writing characters and 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 sort of thinking of kind of bits of plot. And we talked about various ideas. We talked about nostalgia. We talked about politics. We talked about that. And then one day I'm like, let's just, do you want to write a novella? And And they were like, it's not going to be a novella, Helen. It's going to be a long book. And I'm like, no, no, it'll be 40,000 words. <laughs> sin is always right yeah. so we started writing this book together and it was instantly the most fun i've had in my life writing so please don't tell my editors who like the nature books that <laughs> it was so much fun it felt illegal and but, we would just write it yeah we, we sent each other messages on twitter with ideas and bits of plot and characters and we went from there backwards and forwards amazing so you mentioned about the the nature writing yes um what what inspired the sudden genre swap and how have your your readers 
responded to it. I am going to interject because usually I would introduce an author with a list of the books <laughs> they've been. I felt like Helen MacDonald didn't need that, oh, but for those true. who don't know, um, her first book, H is for Hawk, is sort of almost at, at the time, it was a, an incredible book that's gone on to be a huge success. But let me just get it out there. Helen MacDonald is the queen of nature writing. Um, so this was a different thing. This did shock people, yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think uh, you're talking a little bit about the pandemic. What happened was, I was saying last night, you know, most people were like, oh, um, I can go out into the beauty of the May countryside during lockdown and I can commune with nature and feel healed. Um, you must have done that, Helen. You're into nature, and I'm like, no, no, no. I I just stayed in the house. I just stopped. I went off nature completely, and I ended up just watching action movies and eating ice cream and crying. That's all I did. Um, so, but I've always been a massive sci-fi fan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was growing up, I I you know did all the kind of old school Asimov and Clark and Philip K. Dick. Of course, I adored. Um, that also coincided with my taking drugs at university stage. Um, and then there was a kind of like a whole series of I, I really adored those 1950s style magazines that like you know amazing magazine and uh, I just I just adored it um and then I had a kind of massive uh uh William Gibson phase and but it was like you know that was kind of like the part of my life that never really spoke mm -hmm. and then when this book was written there was just a joy in letting that side of myself come out really wow and it's also a queer story. It's a very queer story. And we've um, been reading it with the outhouse LGBT book. Oh, books, nice. Yeah. I think. Um, I, I've found, as a bookseller, I've noticed that quite a lot of sci fi and um, fantasy books yeah. have queer themes, yeah. or a lot of queer stories fall into the sci fi fantasy genre. Um, do you think there's a reason for that? And did that influence your decision to? to to write a sci-fi story? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think it influenced a decision. Um, it was always going to be a gay love story, a queer love story. Um, because of the nature of the characters you were working with, they just seemed like the perfect odd couple. And as you know, the world is full of odd couple bromance movies where things should happen and don't. And we're like, what the hell? Let's just go there. You know, these people are, we're not going to have that. Um, but sci-fi of its nature has always been a kind of critique of, of, of cultural mores and gives you the freedom to uh, posit futures in which various forms of um, bigotry and, and sort of social um, things are, are, are sort of broken and made free. And I, th I think that, of course, you know, they're a natural home for queer stories. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, no, I mean, I just... <laughs> Even the straighter sci-fi is super queer. It's a bit like horror. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are hor horror elements. Yeah, there's horror in... Oh, you forgot the horror. Yeah, there's the horror, horror too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a bit where a Pac-Man machine eats someone. Yeah. Um, which upsets a lot of people. And it's worse. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. And dogs that aren't dogs. And we kill Mr. Rogers. I don't know if Mr. Rogers is someone that you all know here. In America, he is basically David Attenborough meets God, and um, we kill him, or a version of him, and it upsets American readers so much, and Sin is delighted by this. She's like, <laughs> our job is done. But yeah, okay. so that's basically the... Yeah. And, and I suppose queer stories tend to focus around tragedy, or a, a, around the struggles of being queer, or the homophobia, or transphobia, yeah. or whatever, yeah. and this story doesn't do that. No, that was definitely on purpose. Mm -hmm. We didn't want that at all. Um, in fact, initially, Adam was Adam was going to be a trans character. He was mm -hmm. going to be a trans man. And we decided not to do that for reasons. I can't remember. There was a reason that... I don't think it was even a very big decision. He just sort of ended up being 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 cis. But, like, so... I completely forgot your question. I was just thinking about why we... What was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm only just drinking my coffee. How queer stories yes. tend to focus around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they always die at the end. Yes. Yeah, everyone dies at the end. I said to my mum about this. I'm like, well, you know, we're writing, we're writing this book together and it's like, it's going to have an ending where, you know, the people don't die because people always die at the end of queer stories. And she went, no, they don't. And I said, well, no, they do. And she said, I was just watching the best exotic married gold hotel. And uh, I'm like, yeah. no, he dies. He dies. <laughs> and she goes, oh, he does. Oh, no, he does. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a sort of sense that, that that had to be righted. And I think, you know, clearly I think that trope is on the way out now. But even the other day I was talking to a friend of mine about whether they'd seen the show Fellow Travellers. And he was like, no, I don't want to watch another story about closeted people being unhappy and then one of them dying at the end. And I'm like, no, no, fair enough. Maybe. So, yeah. And the characters themselves, mm -hmm. 
I love these two characters. I love these two. They're terrible, terrible men. But they're also they come across as real people. They have yeah. nuance. They have contradictions within themselves. Yeah. That I I wonder whether having two authors writing these characters kind of contributed to that in in them feeling more rounded um, because maybe each of you had a slightly different idea of who the character yeah. was. And so it became yeah. more nuanced and more. Very much so. And and that was a magic that I didn't expect. There's something about writing uh, a collaborative collaboratively that when it starts to go well, it's really extraordinary when you, when you are writing characters, because there's a Rao in my head and there's an Adam in my head, mm -hmm. and they're not quite the same as the Adam and Rao in Sin's head. So when we were writing together, we created, as you say, these characters that, that, that had contradictions within them, just as we, we all do which made them feel real. Um, and we, that was a really lovely thing to sort of experience. And that kind of supervened as we wrote, we began to see them. And of course, the more real they got on the page, the more easy, the easier they were to write. Um, and they're both maddening characters. I mean, the book is largely also about trauma. And I think many, you know, childhood trauma, there's a horrible thing where I'm going to give you a sub spoilers here, but Rao has this ability not to tell when people are lying but to know whether any statement about the world is true or false, which is a really cool and really devastatingly affecting kind of power to have. So imagine him growing up, mm. knowing when his family are not telling the truth or knowing when close ones aren't telling the truth. And he becomes a very lonely kind of man. Um, so that was like a really interesting thing to, to, to play with too. Yeah. Mm. I wanted to ask about Rao's yeah. superpower as yeah. well. Um, when you've got he a character, hates it when Adam calls it superpower, yeah, I know. It's <laughs> <why it's fast. laughs> um, but when you've got a character that has this seemingly yeah. unlimited superpower, yeah. you can tell when something's true. Did you find that difficult to write with the plot and not have that just be the the answer to every yeah. problem? It's going to be a problem in in books to come. I think that one that, that we, we kind of trapped ourselves with that. So yeah, so so. Um, a couple of things. First of all, he, he can't tell with Adam anything about Adam or anything Adam says. He can't ascertain a truth value, which is something we basically nick from Twilight, where one of the... <laughs> anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Twilight fan. <I> <laughs> it was very funny. So, um, and then the, the truth thing is like, I don't know. He's, um, my God, my, I haven't had enough coffee. Just Remind me again. Sorry, this is just like, honestly just me being hot. Is there enough in that cup? Yes, I'll be fine. We can get the superpower. Yeah. Um, or in terms of narrative, exactly. That yeah. was the thing, right? So, sorry, I'm not normally this scatty. I'm honestly just super tired. And has just flown back from the states as well. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm, I'm, I'm there. So yeah. So if you think about like a, the the way that a detective or a mystery works, it's it's really problematic to have a character that knows what's true and what isn't straight away. But also, it's really fun. So there were kind of like. You know, in Star Wars or something where there are all these coincidences that happen, you know, you'll, you'll arrive on a planet and instantly meet the person that you're supposed to meet that will make this happen, who is usually related to you in some way. But with Rao, you know, if you want to get find him to find someone, there doesn't need to be a long kind of complicated way in which he, they sort of work out how to get to this person. He just goes to a map and goes, yes, 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 he's there, you know. So it was kind of fun to play with that. Mm. But the the main kind of antagonist, I guess, although that not really antagonist, but the substance profit in the book, there's something about the quality of profit that makes it very hard to tell whether it's true or not for the nature of this thing. So when it came to big questions about profit, the substance, that also becomes something that Rao can't answer questions about. And that is very helpful. Otherwise the book would have been over in about 20 pages. So um, it was hard, but it was also really fun. And, and a very dear friend of mine is a philosopher of language. Um, so when we worked out that Rao had this this gift to be able to tell what's true and what isn't, there were these very long conversations with with Christina, uh, who is a brain the size of a planet, about exactly how exactly what the limits of his his ability are. So you know, vagueness is a is a big philosophical thing, and he can't tell emotions particularly well, but he just knows whether things are true or not. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of the question of truth is something that is kind of played within the novel. Yeah, and you you mentioned that. Adam is the only person that, that yeah. Rao can't yeah. do that superpower with. Yeah. Um, could you tell us more about the reasons behind that decision? Um, well, it was funny. <laughs> it was funny in Twilight. Um, <laughs> but there are reasons why that is the case that 
are not answered in this book. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the book, you get an explanation from Rao as to why he thinks he can't read Adam. Um, secret under the table talk here. That's not the reason he can't read Adam. And we're going to find out in other books why mm. that can't happen. Oh, but sick. but the... What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... I know I'm giving big spoilers away now. But the thing about this is, that, you know, think about that little boy again, growing up, knowing what's true and what isn't. Oh, we talked about this a little bit last night, that... Because Rao can't tell with Adam, Adam is the first person he's ever had to learn to trust, to actually trust what he's not lying and trust what mm -hmm. he's doing. And I think that trust is, is the precondition for love. So he needs to learn to trust someone before he can truly love someone, and that person ends up being Adam. So, yeah, that was important wow. for the um, um, story. We were talking last night at the Appetite Book Club. Um, uh, lots of people were discussing the plot and coming up with their own theories. Ooh, and, ooh, I want to know them all. Because the book, what I love about this book is it doesn't patronize the reader at all. No, no. Don't we hate... hold the reader's hand and say, no. this is this, this is how it works. There's no... I hate authors that talk down to me. Yeah. But I know, I know that. There yeah, are yeah. huge exposition chapters. I call this the it... Frederick Forsyth thing. So like Frederick Forsyth, sorry, I'm butting in, no, but no, I love no, this. No, just... The Frederick Forsyth expository mode. So a character is you know, gun running or like um, smuggling diamonds. And then suddenly over three pages, you have a history of the diamond industry mm -hmm. for no reason. You're like, okay, we Got don't do that. The dialogue yeah. in, in the story. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and because that's the case, we only ever know as much as Adam and Rao know yeah. about what's going on. Yeah. But obviously you and Sin as authors. <laughs> yes. No, you know, we know all the things. You yeah, know yeah. We are you know what it is, where it's from, yeah. what the purpose you is. You say and that. I mean, do you, they may not. No, no, we do. I'm assuming that you do. <laughs> <laughs> you might not. Do you want an explanation of profit? Would yeah, that be please. useful? Okay. <laughs> so, um, the book the book starts basically with a with a, a diner turning up in a field in Suffolk, which delights me because I live in Suffolk and. I was driving around in the foggy evening one day and thought, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a diner in the middle of that sugar beet field? And then it all kind of came from there. Um, this subject, this substance profit sort of slips into our world um, during an experiment in a university on, on creating novel superconductors. So the conditions on this are this sort of diamond vice holding this sample and something sort of tears from through dimensions and this, this sort of stuff gets in, this silvery stuff. And it has this terrible effect on people that when they're exposed to it, it gives them a kind of psychic shock that makes them think of desperately of something safe from their past or an object that represents safety. The object is then created in real life by profit. And then using the image on the mind of the person that it's affected, and then if the person touches it, they get sort of stuck to it and go into a trance. And if you take it away, they die. So it's a bit of a kind of political statement on mm -hmm. late capitalism and consumerism. But um, so profit as a substance, it's whole, it's a bit like a slime mold going through all the universes and dimensions. And what it does is it wants to bring complicated life to places where there's no life. And it, but it doesn't have any ability to represent its... Um, it doesn't have representational state, so it needs minds to do that work for it. It needs minds to imagine life, and then it can create it. And um, what happens when it meets people for the first time is that initially it just makes them feel nostalgic, then they start creating objects, and the more brains it, in it interacts with, the more people it infects, the more it learns how to make things. Mm. So it changes through the, through the book and grows more intelligent, but it's not an intelligent thing. It's just, it's just, just what it does. Mm -hmm. And Rao has this particularly important role for it because of his ability to remember everything and to know what's true and what isn't, which you will discover if you read the book. So he can make things that are He can make true. things that are actually true. Mm -hmm. And because he remembers things perfectly and knows what's, what true is, if he makes something, it is, it is perfect. So he can make living things, like really living things. Like you remember, he imagines a lizard and then he can make a lizard like it's it's actually a, a real thing not just a, an approximation because all of us had rubbish we're not able to do that we just make things that are sort of our imaginations are not very good at creating things mm. sorry it's not very <laughs> articulate is it who would have thought i was a writer <laughs> <laughs> you know those things so but, yeah going back to the the nostalgia yes uh, thing um using nostalgia as a weapon and the the villain almost being nostalgia in a, in a way in this novel um why did you decide to write about nostalgia and were there any political or sociological yeah things that were going on in, in that decision yeah no absolutely i mean we're living in a world of you know make 
make Britain great again, make America great again. You know, we, we're living in a world where a Facebook post about a chocolate bar from the 1980s will have like 3,000 comments about how Britain is rubbish and we should bring back the, you know, hanging. Um, it's, it's a very, very, it's already weaponized nostalgia. It's weaponized politically. It's weaponized in terms of like um, selling things. Um, it's weaponized to create division. I mean, it's, it's, you know, this is making them into real, real weapons in the book is only a little, like a little sort of step across the truth. And that was always going to be, I think, part of the, the job of the book was to kind of be a, a sort of satire on, on how terrible everything is now that, you know, it's, it's, um, we're living in a world where I was saying last night, we're living in a world where there's very little, Im it's very hard to imagine a livable future. Um, it's very easy to remember the past and take refuge in it. Um, and one of the reasons that it's a love story is that at the end of the book, you know, if people get together, there is suddenly a sort of potential future that both of them are imagining that to set against the fact that everything else is looking backwards. So that's, mm -hmm. that's why you make it. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big, um, but nostalgia isn't always bad, you know? I mean, I remember things from my childhood and there's no real political weight to that. I really remember there was a really nice time at a paddling pool or the time I first got on a horse and fell off. Actually, that's not a very good memory. I fell off, but yeah. So it's, 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 it's quite neutral as a, as a activity, but like the, when it becomes weaponized by mm -hmm. political, um, you know, grifters, <laughs> it does become mm. extremely dangerous. I, I guess what you're saying here leads on to the question that I'm sure you're asked at every event that you do about mm -hmm. this book. And what would your object be? <laughs> if you were exposed to profit, what would you create? Um, I could tell you Sin's one first, maybe. Okay. I've got time. Yeah, Sin, Sin, has, Sin, has, Sin wrote all of the Adam scenes in this, all the baby Adam bits in the book that are really des distra terribly distressing because he had this terribly abusive father. And she kept saying, oh, I'm going to send you another Adam bit I've written. And I've been, oh, no, <laughs> I don't want to read it. Um, so Sin grew up in, in America, in California. Um, and one of her favorite films is um, The Brave Little Toaster. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's a little Disney film about a toaster and his electrical friends who get abandoned by their family and have to try and find their way back. It's a bit like The Incredible Journey, only toasters. And um, I've never seen it. But um, since when she was a, when she was a kid, her dad they had the toaster, and he drew the face of the brave little toaster on the toaster. So you know, as a kid, you don't really it is the brave little toaster. But then they had to move to Ireland, and the voltage is different, so they had to leave it behind. So mm -hmm. they still think of a little toaster somewhere in a landfill in California. Ooh, soon. <laughs> um, mine is a mine is a model dinosaur, two model dinosaurs that I had when I was a kid. Um, my mum and dad used to drop me off at the Natural History Museum when I was a kid um, on Saturday mornings and then just go off shopping. I think they'd be arrested now. <laughs> and I, I loved it. I learned everything. That's where I became a real natural history geek. And um, I had these two model dinosaurs from the shop, which I adored. There's a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus. Um, and uh, I still have them. I, in fact, I got them back. My mum my mom gave them away when I was a teenager to the kids next door, and I was absolutely furious <laughs> I gave the kids other things, but yeah, <laughs> so I still have those. And I think those are the, th the, the, the I have them on my windowsill. Yeah. Oh. So uh, a question that we got from someone from the Appetite Book Club, okay. Sarah. Yes. Um, was how did you come across the concept of transitional objects? Whoa, changing, changing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, transitional objects. So um, lots of the things in profit are transitional objects. Uh, which are very important to kids. So think of a teddy bear, for example, or a like a we talk about my, my my brother had a num num blanket. So as you sort of wean yourself away from feeling that you're part of the mother, you have what's called a transitional object, which kind of replaces her. It's kind of a halfway house, which becomes a very important thing for you and imbued with enormous amounts of sort of psychic emotion and, and importance. And that I think was um Winnicott is the guy who develop this concept as a, a sort of uh, a psychoanalyst. And, and I think I would have read that back when I was a student, mm -hmm. back when Freud was still really in and I was doing English and there are all these Freudian readings of texts. And I just love that everyone now is like, oh my God, no. You know? so, wow. um, yeah, transitional objects are very interesting. And um, I think the way that profit works, very often those objects are the objects that are conjured into existence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before we open up the questions, I have to ask, 
are you Adam or Rao? And is oh. it Adam or Rao? <laughs> well, it's not that simple. It kind of is. <laughs> um, so should we just say that <laughs> I am an Oxbridge-educated, completely chaotic person who is addicted to cigarettes and had a misspent youth. I'm not massively promiscuous, though. In fact, quite the opposite. <laughs> basically a hermit. But yeah, I, and I have raging ADHD. So basically, yeah, it was very easy for me to write Rao. Um, and I swear a lot as well, which I'm not doing right now. And um, Thin is a very stoic, sort of quite silent person who grew up in America and is very good at cars and has a fascination with um, lots of military things. Yeah, no, I think she's definitely <laughs> an Adam. <laughs> but, you know, we learned to write, we learned to write each other's characters so um and but the thing was really funny when we were writing it is that i would write adam and then i'd send this stuff to sin and sin would be like what what is this adam you're making adam sound like jane austen they don't use the subjunctive in the u.s <laughs> military so i feel like it was all like what did it were so simple she's like no that's not how adam talks and then occasionally i'd like say you know Raoul wouldn't say that you know he's not going to say gotten and you know it, not that Brutally, but like, yeah, so we did learn kind of, you know, there are a lot of very weird distinctions between American English and British English mm -hmm. that I didn't know. And the one that always gets me is quite. Quite. Do you know the quite problem? This is really awful. So I have friends in America, I'd go to America and I'd make them food and they go, oh, it's quite nice. And I'd be like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm crushed. And they'd be like, what do you mean? So America, it's an intensifier. Quite oh. nice means very nice. Whereas, as you know, here, that's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a really interesting one to, to get to learn. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the book is so rich. And as Jamie alluded, the characters are so real because you've questioned your characters all the way. Mm. I'm saying this. No, he would never have said that. No, he yeah, wouldn't. yeah. And yeah. you have two people looking at two characters. It's so clear. And also, like, I think the, the thing that both of us were very keen to do is to... There are very many books, very many books, where characters have traumas and then the traumas come to light. And then magically, somehow, mm -hmm. having talked about it, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. um, Adam and Rao are both deeply traumatized people um, and they know it. Yeah. They know they're traumatized and they know they're always going to have to work around that trauma. Mm -hmm. It's always going to affect them. And when we were talking last night, I would say it's a bit like I always think of trees on cliffs. You know, there's a sort of salt wind hitting them as they grow, and they grow into particular shapes that mm. aren't the normal shapes of trees. But the trees are beautiful and completely healthy and mm. fine. They're just not the shape that mm. they would otherwise be in. So, yeah, they are deeply human, deeply flawed, um, infuriating people. Do you think more authors should collaborate with other authors? And, and It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. Like, I, I, I found my ego um, really did a here quite unexpectedly <laughs> early on i was like saying last night confessing that there was you know the first time that i sent something to sin and sin really did like critique it and said no i don't think this works there was this voice in me that was like you haven't published and i've won awards <laughs> <laughs> which is so bad and and i realized you know that there was this weird kind of carapace of ego that i had no idea existed and and um that the the great the only thing where you can do a collaboration is to just be totally vulnerable and take the blows, you know, take the hits. And and then eventually, if you keep working together, there comes this extraordinary point where you do sort of develop a kind of a shared mind about the book. And it can be really exhilarating. You know, the whole way that publishing and, and authorship and the way that we're led to believe it exists is that kind of 19th century genius model of the kind of miserable person in their garret, you know, smoking opium and, you know, scratching away with it. I don't quite know where I went there. We don't need the opium or the <laughs> <laughs> But it's an individual mind, you know, doing the job. Um, you know, let me read this novel about a middle-aged man having a crisis, having fallen in love with one of his students, like, you know, that kind yeah. of novel. Yeah. And I think one of the queer things about this novel is that the collaboration, it's, it's, it's not the normal kind of narrative uh, mode and it's deeply deeply vulnerable and deeply exciting when it when you begin to develop a language um and a voice that is a shared voice it's really thrilling so yes everyone should try it and that's why i feel that this book is a queer novel in more than many ways not just the fact that it has two men who yeah have a well Rao's not quite a man Rao's kind of more fluid than than just okay. being a man but um 
yeah so so yeah it's it's a super queer book yeah um the themes um, are queer and the, are waves, queer, like the cover is queer, queer the cover and, is very yeah queer. and then there's a really funny thing so like it's in, in america like uh, occasionally i get reviews on the internet from really angry men who are like i thought this is military sci-fi <laughs> but it was all this stuff that was rammed down my throat and like nothing was rammed down your throat so um but i'm really delighted that people come to this from very different places and most of the people that have read it that some people find the kind of it's quite disjointed to start with because profit does odd things with time mm -hmm. and we we took a lot of cues from fanfic as well like fic on the internet which is this wonderful ecosystem of people who aren't being paid writing millions and millions of stories about like um you know characters transformative works about characters they see on tv or in books or whatever mm -hmm. we we adore that sin and i adore that ecosystem and a lot of the kind of the, the, the form of that writing we also kind of pay homage to in this book. And one of that is we wanted to give our characters the feeling that they were fanfic of characters that didn't exist. So we, we played with time. We gave them a backstory. So a lot of those, a lot of people reading this book from the publishing industry were like, Oh my God, I've never read anything like this book. And Sid and I are like, have you not read any, <laughs> have you not read any fic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it's a, it's, it's the tropes are very, very, you know, there's even sharing a bed, which is a classic thick trope. <laughs> it's like, oh no, there's only one bed, you know, like, so, um, yeah, that was a really interesting thing. So yeah, that, that also, and thick in, in, of his nature is very much kind of a queer thing to be, to be doing. So yeah, it comes from all directions. And it's very wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Very wibbly wobbly, wobbly timey wimey. That's yeah. very David Tennant there, our hero <laughs> at the moment. Yes. And this idea of working in collaboration with another author, yeah. I wonder if because you guys have not met mm -hmm. in 10 years, but had a, relationship friendship by word yeah. only yeah then it really led itself to working whereas if you were two mates down the pub let's go to the cinema you like physical friends but since very very textual like sin at the moment is in my spare room um you know with covid don't worry i've, I've been very very good with the masking and the you know the hand washing and stuff you know just basically be locked in there <laughs> But, we, you know, even even when they're staying at my house, we're, we're just texting each other. We're sort of messaging each other in the other room. So it's it's a very much a kind yeah. of textual friendship. So and I'm sure that's why it's worked rather yeah. than two friends who suddenly go, why don't we write a book one day? You haven't got that ground in. Um, but look at the time. Look at the time. No. Questions no. from our Yes, brother. tell me um, on anything you like. We can keep chatting, but we have one there. I can just see in the middle. Oh, good, because I haven't got my glasses on, so you'll have to do it's, this. It's, <laughs> it's, it's at the, um, the... Hello! The chosen ones with the sunshine. Thank you. That's right. That's fun. Oh, soft. It. Ooh, lovely. Hello. Is, is it on? Yes. It's on. Hello. You know, I just wondered, hi. I just wondered how you actually went about structuring the book in writing when there was two of you. So had you, like, worked out a plan, first of all? And well, obviously you said that Sin did all the Adam sections. Yeah. But otherwise, had you worked out, right, we're going to have now, then before, then now, then before, then now, then before. Yeah, right? that's a really good question. And, like, colour-coded. No, there was no colour <laughs> class. And the thing is, it's really fun, because, like, you know, basically, Sin and I are the opposite when it comes to things like this. Like, Sin is, is very into kind of structure and, like, I, sh I, I hope they don't mind me saying this, but, like, you know, with this COVID, they were having nightmares that were actually really happy dreams that weren't nightmares about being trapped in a first-person shooter game in an Excel spreadsheet. That's That's sin. I was like, oh, God, that sounds awful. She's like, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the kind of person that at university and college, when I was told to plan my essays, as soon as I plan something, I can't write. Mm -hmm. I, I need to just intuit where the thing's going as it's going. So there was that kind of conflict. So it ended up with us being, we had a sort of general sense of where the book would end up. So the ending was always kind of, we knew that that was going to happen. There'd be this kind of crazy set piece with all this weird stuff happening and, dimensions and things um but and we knew that there would be the clock in the middle which is a very important thing because the the stories kind of go in like an hourglass to this one point the clock but apart from that we we did just we talk about it and we just give it a go um so those were the, the sort of the beginnings the clock and the end were the only fixed points and then we sort of worked around them um and we we did have disagreements yeah definitely um and there were there's a lot of stuff we didn't put in that we wrote there's there's sort of there's a really traumatic adam going on his first being taken on his first deer hunting trip with his dad um section where adam ends up killing the deer with a knife because it was the most efficient way and his dad gets quite freaked out 
and then says, tell your mother that I did it. <laughs> so there were all these things that were really interesting, but they, when, when you read the book, they didn't fit and they were, they were, so there's a kind of sense, I always tell writers, I was just teaching writing in, oh God, that sounds really wanky me, but I was teaching writing in Vermont last week. And I was saying that one of the things you have to do when you, when you're writing is to learn to listen to what the book is telling you to do. It's a little bit like working with an animal, actually. See, more, more nature stuff. You know, with a horse or something like that, you know, you want it to go one way, but you can sort of sense where the horse wants to go. And with writing, I always think, let's just see where, where the writing wants to go. And you have to listen quite carefully to know where that is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a really fascinating kind of thing to do. Um, Great answer. Yeah. I'm wondering if the deer scene will appear in a future book. We heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Sheila. Oh, Claire's got one as well. Oh, the back, questions. Oh, Claire, Claire has that. got questions that are coming oh. in via Zoom. So we will call Claire after. Sheila, you're up, though. It's like an Good auction. Morning. Hello. <laughs> um, I have to admit, I found this a struggle. Oh, I'm, I'm, a struggle. I'm not really into science fiction. So I really like a comment that leads to a bit of a, a tongue in cheek question. <laughs> <laughs> um, until I got to about page 340, and then they're going into the facility they to are. rescue the wit, and it all get really exciting. And I'm reading away until so I got page 390, which. The end of the world is just people glued to toys. That sense absolutely polarized me. <laughs> and I thought, if you substitute the word, whoops, phones for toys, you've got it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to stop reading. I had to go and walk around the garden. Oh, no. I, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything else. Yeah. I've never, in all the years I've been reading, I've never been polexed by a, oh a my sense. Love. You absolutely blew my socks off oh. with that. So my question is, soon as you blew my socks off, where do I send the claim form for my missing socks? <laughs> <laughs> Darling, I'll get you some socks. Oh, Let me know. Give me slides afterwards. No, I, no, thank you for that. that that's, that was a real, I, I remember I writing that line. I enjoyed it in the end. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a book. It's a book. It's not a like you were saying about the kind of talking down thing, it's not a, it's a book that I always feel a little bit like a cryptic crossword puzzle. And, mm -hmm. and I've talked about this with, with friends of mine about difficult poetry. You know, there's a way of looking at difficult poetry that's like, oh my God, it's really off-putting and I, you know, it can, it's, it's, it's shutting me out. And I'm like, the other way of looking at it is like, it's a, like it's a cryptic crossword that you're solving with a friend. Like it, it, it's actually fun to kind of try and work out where things are going. And that, that way of reading is what I try and do, but I know it can be really off-putting as well. So I completely understand the moment you're like, because it's it's very it's a very disorienting book in many ways. I'm really really glad that you got like the end, and I'm really really glad you like this the quote about the well I, your sock. I dog. love that. In all um, the years I've been reading, you've I been have never oh man, I'm so moved. Seriously, that's that. made my day. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sheila. And actually, that replacement of the word as well, we haven't even mentioned profit. Profit, profit and profit. P R O F I T. F I T. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I love that. But we do Bless have questions from we do, our yeah. um, Zoom people. Zoom. So over to Claire, please, at the back. Um, it's always good to have someone reading something from the book as well. So thank you, Sheila. Claire from Zoom. Yeah, thank you. So we have got some people watching on Zoom. So this is a question from Claire, not me, Claire. Claire on the Zoom. Other Claire. Other Claire. Um, Helen, you've mentioned deliberately filling the book with favourite tropes. And of course, part of the appeal of tropes is that sense of recognition and familiarity. How does that intersect with the book's treatment of nostalgia? <laughs> it's such a good question. That was done on purpose. So, Where? Not <laughs> no. so, so it's like there's a sort of sense in which, I mean, it's not obviously a as terrible or as awful as the fact that, you know, Rao in the book through his gifts has been used by the military to do terrible things. And he feels culpable for that. He's, he's totally kind of like the rest of the book is basically him trying to atone for the things that he did by trying to help. He always tries to help and then things go really bad. And I love the sense that this is a book that's a critique of, um, the ways that nostalgia are used 
but also as a reader, you're you're culpable in following the same tropes that you find comforting because you've seen them a million times before or because they remind you of books you read you when you were small. It makes the reader culpable too. And that was done on purpose, but like we're all hypocrites, all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that I'm very nostalgic about that I as I said, I don't feel that they are contaminated by political law, but I'm sure they are. Um yeah, so it was it was like a big fairy tale arc to the book with the, you know, sort of, sorry, I'm spoiler, but the big sort of kiss at the end, you know. Um, and I, I just, you know, that the strength of those tropes is is very much nostalgia, and that's just part of the way the book was written in perp on purpose, yeah. So did I really answer that? I think I answered that. I, I a really good question. question. Love the answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so back to the room, or do you have more Zoomies? At the front here, then, we have... Hello. Oh. We have a mic. It is the law of roving mics. The questions are always like back to like yeah. back front, isn't it? Yeah. It's not been mentioned at all. Is um Did Rao die? <laughs> Didn't Rao die? Uh yes. Well no. So Rao reappeared, but Rao Okay, so worked. anyone who's not read the book, this is a spoiler, you might want to close your close your ears. <laughs> um the first Rao gets taken by profit mm. into different dimensions and his mind is being used to make new things. But mm. on the moment of his death, wh whatever the death is, he gets, he's not a human anymore. He's just a mind or whatever. Mm. So he's not really Rao anymore, but he kind of, another Rao is made by Adam and Rao and profit. Yeah. Who is exactly down to the atom, the same as the first Rao. But without So skull. in a sense, exactly. In a sense, it is just exactly the same as Rao. But, is it? Mm. We we don't know. Mm. And I think that oh. comes down to your particular, mm. you know, theological, philosophical stance on what makes a person a person. So there's a kind of, there's, I think it's called the swamp thing. You know, if you could make someone exactly the same, would it be a human being? So for Rao, the answer is yes, he's exactly the same. He has all the same memories. He's just still a disaster. He looks the same. He feels the same. He remembers everything up to that point. But the question is, is he, is he Rao? So that's left open for mm. you to. Yeah. book two, or that kind of stuff. Possibly. Good. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, we you. have a question at the front here. Thank you. Hi. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, on that, did you take that idea from the ship of Theseus? Um, no, I love the ship of Theseus, but um, I think it was more. This one was more the the sort of physicalist notion of identity. So, like you know, if if you is there something extra to people um, and this sort of notion of a soul? So if you did replicate someone exactly down to the atom, would that be the same person? And some people say no, because that's just a, um, a physical reconstruction of a person. And some people say, well, like, everything that we are is our physicality, like the electrical patterns in our brains, like they, the, that's exactly, you would be exactly, the, you would be a, exactly the same person. So it's 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 a slightly different one from the ship of Theseus, which is the great one, of course. Is I don't was it triggers was it the, was it the broom in <laughs> Only Falls and Rooms? Yeah. Triggers broom where he's like, I've had this broom for thirty years. It's had ten. Replace the head. Replace I've replaced the, the head yeah. five times and the handle twelve times. You know, it's that kind of story. Is it the same thing once it's been replaced? So it's not quite the same, but it's it's very much the same. And I think the ship of Theseus has had a bit of a moment recently. I think it was in One Division. There was a whole bit with the ship of Theseus yeah. in there. Um, which I really loved that show, actually. It was great. If you haven't seen One Division, it's phenomenal. And again, plays with nostalgia in a really interesting mm. way. So that's a really good question, though. Thank you. These are all great questions. <laughs> all great questions. Any? Oh, so, wait, sorry, I've got a question. What were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit like being at an auction. Oh, Ken's got one. Ken, hello. Sorry if it's a question, but it kind of picks up on let's call it, for me anyway, this kind of ambiguity of the end. And it's something to do with Rao being a sort of queer Jesus. Yeah. that's Because that, I wasn't sure if, if he'd come back from the dead or what, 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 what was going on there. Because he had this capacity for, like, Christ. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we, we love like on the sins of the world. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no, we laughed about this a lot. In, and no, absolutely. It's, sorry, I'm so excited about this. Because, like, I, there was someone last night and you were the first people that picked up on this. And we did it on purpose, kind of mischievously. Um, but it's a legitimate reading. Um, you know, Rouser Brown Jesus. You know, he, he 
he takes on through you know prophet streams up into him he's actually literally like this when it does and you could read prophet as all the sins of the world that he takes into himself and then disappears with them and then on christmas eve is is reborn i mean hello <laughs> but no one has picked this up and i think it's because he's brown like i just think that people are like it can't be jesus isn't jesus brown to begin with <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, he's, you know, Rao Ra Ra doesn't have much truck with monotheism, but um, uh, that is a legitimate reading, and we did that on purpose, yeah. So. Do we get brownie points in Essex? Yeah, you do. Essex is that. the first county to get this. Um, Good one, Ken. Yeah. But that um, wasn't, that's not the point of, it's not like the line in the witch in the wardrobe where the whole point is that Aslan is Christ. It's, it's, it's a sort of not quite, it's not, that's not the, the whole point of the book. So, but it's well done you. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was fun. Just there the um, just a couple of things. I know lots of people have asking about the ending and that was going to be my initial question, but I don't need to ask that anymore. A comment really. So I'm not, I'm, not read a lot of sci-fi i didn't come to this as sci-fi uh i didn't come to it as a queer love story i wouldn't have called it a queer love story i would just called it a love story yeah do you have to call it a queer love story i mean is it important for I, I don't the know, queer I mean... community to call it that because i'm you know just i'm saying it as white heterosexual mm. not from a marginalized community that's just one question. It's a really good question. And I think um, the reason that I would say that it's important to say it is a queer love story is that there are so many no, not queer love stories <laughs> out there. I remember speaking to um, a writer who had a very, a very famous show that came out quite recently um, involving two leads who everyone was sort of shipping as you know they're two male leads and they were like oh my god they're in love they're in love they're in love and i was talking to him about that and i'm like are you going to bring this out like in everyone wants it and he was like no 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 we have to have representation for the straights as well and i'm like but they they have a lot <laughs> wow. so I, I think this is a big adventure love story and there have been so many that that are, that are not queer that i think Pushing the queerness of this one, I think, is important to me and to the other writer. But that doesn't mean you have to read it like that. You can read it as a love story between two broken people, and they can stand for literally anyone. Um, but for me, it's it's important. It's a good question. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such good questions, Essex. Well, I know done. you're brilliant. Well oh, done. Move to Essex. The, the Essex Book Festival yeah. will, will be feeling proud of us. So this is a book club question. Um, um event we we'll do one more question from tommy um but we um meet monthly there are two book clubs in the house today we've got the red line books one we've also got the outhouse one um all books are always available at red line books um helen is going to walk up to red line books now if you would like to buy profit i'm presuming lots of you have already got it I can but, sign, but we can sign extra I'll sign anything. Christmas presents. <laughs> um, if anybody wants next month's book for the appetite red line books book club i'll just be over there so that's the admin out of the way let's end with a lovely question from a young human hello. Tommy. hi tommy hello hello um i've heard you know on the process of writing that sometimes it can be sort of dangerous to think something is going to be successful um as you're writing it yeah and i think it's important to have fun of course and to to make something as best it, as it can be but i was wondering if you had any opinions on the notion of success and when you're writing do you think you know i'm gonna make this i've never thought that know? yeah i've never yeah. thought that and and i think that's really important for me um when ages for hawk which was a huge success when i finished that book i didn't send it to my editor for like a week i was so nervous i was like this is a really weird book i'm always more scared that it's that my editors or my publishers aren't going to like it than than the audience which is probably a weird way of looking at it but um, they are the gatekeepers there yeah. they are but like you know i remember i when i was teaching Again, you know, the other week I was talking to someone who was writing a, a really beautiful uh, project or, a, about some trauma that happened to them, and they were pulling their punches when they were writing about stuff, um, emotionally pulling their punches rather than, you know, not, you don't have to describe everything that happened, but you, you need to be, readers know when you're keeping stuff back and they know when you're dissembling. It's really, really clear to you. So I said, like, why aren't you writing what you feel, really? And she was like, well, I don't think a reader's going to want to know that stuff. And I'm like, 
F the reader. When you write, you write according to the logic of your own heart and what you're writing. If you start thinking about readers, everything will, it will just, it's a disaster. You end up with, you know, formulate stuff that, and you, and you, you know, that, that whole, that you can tell when someone's writing something for an audience, it, it doesn't ring true. So yeah, um, much as I adore readers, they're for afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like, there are big decisions, like, again, like not, not talking down to readers or, you know, or a particular kind of stance that you're taking as you write, like a, a kind of confiding tone if it's an autobiography or whatever. But, but in terms of like, if you start worrying about what readers are going to think of what you're writing, it's 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 really hard to write from the heart. Then, so mm. that's my advice: just you. do the do the work, have fun, and um, yeah, oh. f the reader. That, well, I that love sounds bad knows, though when I'm talking to audiences. No, but. I love that. We've got our lovely award-winning author talking to the next. Yeah, I want to read all your books. Come on, lad. Come on, lad. Um, um, and we are so privileged to have you. No, I'm room. privileged. I've no, had the best privileged. time. No, <laughs> you are. <laughs> Thank and, you. And because this is being recorded, I would love it if we all did a a big one, two, three to say hello to Sin, who can't be here because they will watch this back later on. So, hello, Sin. Hello, oh, Sin. Hello, Sin. 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 We have not forgotten that you're involved, and I think Helen has done you proud. Thank you, everyone. Um, a big cheer for Helen. Helen and Jamie will and go Jamie, back to Red Line Books. Yeah, we're going to be signing. And... They'll be signing. I'll be over Sorry. there. So thank you, Jamie. Sorry, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Woo! Oh, no. It's been a joy.